It is four o'clock in the workshop of the Homecoming Center, and we are here to discuss Based on Truth. I am Christy Vaya. I am the owner of Liberty Books out in Elgin Valley, and it's my absolute honor and delight to be talking about blending research and fiction and blurring the bound between past and present with Wanjiro Konangi. On my left, David Ralph Viviers on the far side, and Craig Higginson, who is in the middle. I have put their books out in the front. So Wanjiro's novel is called The Havoc of, uh, the Havoc of Choice. Craig's is The Ghost of Sam Webster, and David's is Mirage. If you didn't see it when you walk in, please take notes, stand up. Otherwise, I'm going to be doing a weird dance and <coughs> holding them up while we talk. We are here to celebrate books. So yes, we'll be talking more widely about the writing process, but ultimately we'll be focusing in here on the books that these incredible writers have created through the blending of fact and fiction and their research processes. So Wanjiro Kunangi is a Kenyan writer and entrepreneur. She is a restorer of libraries and a revitalizer of public spaces. Her debut novel, The Havoc of Choice, was written as a result of or through her master's in creative writing process, which she did here in Cape Town. David Vivier's debut novel also came through a master's, which he did here at UCT, um, Mirage, and he is also an actor who has won a Fleur de Cup award for his theatre work, but also been in various film and TV roles, including Vinalandas, which Ooh. gets a very cheeky wink, <laughs> a cheeky wink in the novel. Um, and Craig Higginson is not a debut novelist. This is his eighth novel, and there are six of his novels downstairs at the sales center down below. So I think only Dam Damon Galgut, I think, has got one more than you on sale, English novels, but... The other two are out of print, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, so it's not a unambiguous success story. No. Total empty. <laughs> if I find them, I will sell them for very, very lots of money. So, yes. Um, so, we have done the introductions. Yes, we have. Um, so, oh, we're still on Craig, I think. Yes, so eight, eight novels is the eighth novel. Also, eight plays, so very prolific playwright, and as well as the theatre director. Um, his novels have won, I think, the only writer to win, to win the UJ main prize twice, um, for The Landscape Painter and um, The Dream House. So... It's an incredible honor to be here discussing these two novels with them. Um, I've had been at panels previously where there's been a definite sense of like how are we connecting these three novels together. And for me, there are incredibly um, vibrant, vital ways these three novels talk to each other. And hopefully, once you buy these novels, you will discover those in your conversations with the books yourselves. Um, so these are th all three incredibly intricately crafted works mm -hmm. of heartbreaking genius. All three are, de are dedicated to a family member who has died, and all three are haunted by ghosts. Um, there are people who have lost loved ones. There are families who have, off have fallen apart or are be busy being torn apart. And those personal and familial losses are reflected in and reflected, reflected through the landscapes, the cultures, the communities, um, the countries which these stories take place in. So to start with The Havoc of Choice, Wanjiro's novel, um, the book is about a family and about a particular political family. And if you know your Kenyan politics, which I didn't, but I do tend to live in a bit of a bubble, um, you will know that Wanjiro's surname also has political associations. So if you'll tell us a little bit about the family who's at the center of your novel um, and your own, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, we're going right in there. <laughs> Um, the Havoc of Choice is a book about an election we had in 2007. It is Kenya's most tragic and most violent election to date. And this is a country that has prided itself in being like the beacon of democracy in the region. We are like, we, we are really sitting on our high horses being like, in the South Africa region, we're the ones who have figured it out. And then we had this election that shocked us all because two days after the election, when they announced their results, half of the country began to fight the other half in the most intricately planned um, violence that I have, I think it's the worst we've had since independence. Um, and that's the truth that the story is, is based on. However, as you mentioned, um, my grandfather was part of the, the group of, of people who fought for independence. So if you say the name, name Koinange, you always get the like, oh, that political family. So people think that I wrote the book about my family. I wish I did. It may have been a bit more interesting, but I didn't because it wasn't about me or, or my family. But I say that being, um, being a descendant of a political 
person, my father was never into politics. My father was very much like one of the characters who's just like, I have experienced politics, I never want to do it. But because I grew up with this idea of who my grandfather was and all the sacrifices he made for the country, because, for instance, my father didn't know his father until he was about 12 years old because his father was in exile. At some point, he himself was sent into exile because they were looking for anybody who was attached to my grandfather. So all I heard about my guka, which is what we call grandfathers, is, is the sacrifice he made for Kenya. Um, nothing about who he was, nothing about what he sounded like or what he even cared about or, or, or like was he a family man. It was all about these big political stories. I was 33 years old when I heard his voice for the very first time because he died before I was born. So that background gave me the very unique perspective to be like, what is it like when your family, when, you, when, you're, when your person, the, the head of your house is kind of given up to the state? And I kind of, from all of the things I'd hear from my grand, from my father, from, from my aunties, from my uncles, I took that into the book to tell the story of a political family going through this very, very violent, very, um, I, I suppose, defining election. Um, and so while none of my family members recognize themselves, I think that my, my, my last name gave me a unique perspective. And you used that perspective to create this very interesting family who is the sort of foundation sort of through which you're telling the story. So you tell us a little bit about, about Kavati and yeah. Kavata. And sure. So the, the Habakkuk choice is, is the, the, the election is just the setting, but the, the story is about family and choices. So you have Ngugi, who's the leader of the family, and he has fallen in love with Kavata, and Kavata has grown up under the shadow of her father's political career. And Kavata has many rules, and one of them, or the most important one for her husband, is you must never run for office, because I have grown up with a political father. I'm not willing for my kids to sacrifice their father for the nation. Her husband does that exact thing. He runs for office, um, and the decision for him to run for office tears the family apart. So she, Kavata leaves him because of his choice, and she leaves him, um, but leaves her children behind, because again, it's not about the kids, it's about me and him. So she leaves um, her children behind, and she goes away, and the election happens. Um, and in Kenya, most wealthy families, I'm sure most parts of Africa are the same, you have a driver, and a housekeeper, and a watchman. And the way that we vote in Kenya is that when elections happen, everybody goes to their rural home to vote, which makes no sense. You should really vote where you live, right? But no one votes in Nairobi because no one's from Nairobi. We all go to Shags and you vote there. So when the election happens in 07, Kavata's family have all gone to the rural homes to vote and the violence breaks out and everybody's away from Nairobi, but Nairobi is where they want to be. So they're traveling from the coast, they're traveling from the east, from the south, from the west. Um, and through their journeys, the driver's journey, the housekeeper's journey, Kavata's own journey, Ngugi's journey, the children's journey, you really get to see this layered version of what happened in our country um, during the, the two weeks that followed the election. Um, it's not an easy story to, to read. It was difficult to write, um, but it is one that is rooted in truth, to bring it back to the, the topic at hand. <laughs> <laughs> and to carry on that rooting in truth, you yourself were involved, I think, as a sort of music talent artist in the 2007 election. What was your role in doing that? And then also, when you were in at UCT five years later, what was it about Cape Town and conversations in Cape Town which led to the writing of this book? Mm, someone's done her research. <laughs> <laughs> so in my former life, when I was younger and more energetic, I worked in the music industry. Um, I worked in the music industry from when I was 19 to about 27. And I worked for then the largest musician in Kenya. He's, he's still pretty big. His name is Eric Wanaina. And Eric Wanaina got all of this money to go out and to get the youth to vote. So I was his manager at the time. So my plan was to design this project where we went out to Kenya, had road shows, got people to sign up to vote, and the youth specifically. In that election, we had the highest turnout of youth vote in the history of Kenya's elections. And we were so proud of ourselves, but what we didn't see happening was the violence. So when, it, when, it, when the violence happened, we were all just like, we told guys to go and vote, but we should have told them not to fight after the election because nobody saw this happening. So the election kind of happened, the violence happened, we got over it because we were told, accept, move on. We've killed each other, half a million people were displaced. Today, there's still some people who are still displaced from the violence. But the government and the official story was like, we're gonna sweep everything under the rug and we're gonna just keep on moving because we have a nation to build, and we did that. Fast forward five years, my father passes away, I'm heartbroken, I need to leave Nairobi. I want to go to, to, to writing school because I'm done with the music industry. Um, and the only place I can find a creative writing program is here, so I come here. And I come and the plan is to write a massive memoir about my father and to try and kind of grieve him through this, this art. I never got to write that book because when I got here, 
and I would begin to speak to my colleagues at UCT about what I want to write. They're like, where are you from, Kenya? Oh, shame. How are you guys doing after 07? I'm like, we're fine. They're like, how can you be fine? Because of course, South Africa has such an intimate um, relationship with grief and with the trauma, and one that I think seeps into every single conversation you have, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing, but in Kenya, we have none of that. So when people are asking me how you, how you can be okay, I'm like, is there something I'm missing? So I went back, and the five-year distance and not being in Nairobi gave me the space to kind of go back to 07, read everything I could find at the library in UCT and most of the libraries in the southern suburbs to try and remind myself what was happening in my country, even if I was there living through it. And when I was done, after about nine months of research, I'm like, oh no, we cannot be fine. We cannot be fine, and that's how the Havoc of Choice was born. And as she said, I mean, it is a, it's a difficult read, but it is a beautifully written, beautifully crafted Thank read, you. and it's an important read. And we'll be talking more about the impact of, of <coughs> getting these stories, which are based on truth, into the world. But I'd like to move now from this 15-year-old history in Kenya to 150-year-old history in South Africa with Craig's book, The Ghost of Sam Webster. Um, so if you can tell us, Craig, who is Daniel, who or what is the butterfly collector, and what is Daniel doing with the Webster family in your book? So the protagonist of the novel is a guy called Daniel Hawthorne, and he's a novelist um, who had, I mean, talking about truth, based on truth, I mean, a lot of his backstory is quite autobiographical. So a lot of the things that, you know, with his mom and his sister and things um, are, are, are part of my own life. So I'm always telling, you know, I teach, and I've, I'm always telling students, you know, it's not about writing what you know, write about what you don't yet know and want to find out more about, right from a sort of un deep unconscious root that you might not understand or whatever. But actually, as my wife pointed out, when, when I wrote this book, it was all about what I know, actually. Um, so, <laughs> so anyway, so I slightly <laughs> contradict myself. But, but um, so Daniel Hawthorne is, is a novelist and he has got this um, relative um, who is famous for being a coward during the, the Battle of the San um, And there is actually a guy called Walter Higginson who um, is famous in the history books for three times abandoning his fellow men at the heights of battle and stealing someone else's horse. And um, so while everyone else is getting Victoria crosses and rescuing the Queen's colors, Walter Higginson is sort of, you know, making off he's sort of behind the scenes. And anyway, so I thought it'd be interesting um, to, to write a story about someone who's a coward. Um, I, mean, I went down there because there, someone wanted me to maybe write a musical about the Battle of Sandra in, in the sort of guise of sort of Les Mis, and it just sort of seemed that wasn't possible, just politically and, yeah, for a number of reasons. And, but the place was very powerful, and, and, and this strange line mountain and this landscape full of buried bodies from from that battle and from the early 90s, you know, the violence that was happening then and, and more recent murders and very haunting sort of landscape. And so a story sort of evolved, but but the protagonist is this this novelist, Daniel Hawthorne, who's, who was writing a book about his ancestor. He went down to Zululand, sat at this lodge, met the Webster family, um, and met Sam Webster, who's, who's their daughter who was studying his book at, at school. So he went and spoke to their school. And so he's got a bit of a relationship with his family. Um, and then his mother dies and he stops writing the book about his ancestor. So that's sort of pre-story. So the, the novel begins with this girl, uh, this drowned girl being sort of rolled around in the Buffalo River um, in, in this flood, this sort of KZNism flood. And um, she's identified as Sam Webster. So he goes down to sort of be with the family, find out what happened, sort of, not, not in a sort of creepy way, I don't think, I hope, but just in a sort of concern, but, but he sort of goes down there saying, oh, I'm, I'm here to pick up my, no my ancestor novel, but he also gets embroiled in the, in the family and at what might have happened. So it's got this sort of double narrative, a kind of a murder mystery thing, and then this historical narrative. Um, but his version of the history is, is also another way of playing out some of his own things, I think, some of his own issues. So, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's about his ancestor, but, you know, I mean, Oscar Wilde said all criticism is autobiography, I think, but all fiction is also autobiography in a funny way. I think that the, 
the figures that we create are all like figures in a dream, you know, that, that they're all really connected to us on some sort of deep psychic level, even though they have the illusion of, of independence. Um, I don't think I'm at all answering your question, but, but, uh, but, uh, but and, yeah, and, Daniel and Hawthorne is the protagonist. You're asking all the questions. Yeah. Asking all the questions. <laughs> Sorry. No, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's, that's why he's there. I was actually going to mention the, the, the quote in the, in the book where Daniel is at a school because they're studying his book for matrix set work, as many schools have studied your book, The Dream House, for matrix set work, and that advice about don't write what you know, write about what you want to know. And it's obviously something we will be talking about, about that sense of there is such a strong banner for literature at the moment to be, to be produced and to be marketed as own voices, own stories, and what is your perspective and what is the sort of the unique thing which allows you to tell certain stories. Um, and that seems to be in tension with a sort of more research driven, um, but I think often those things aren't, they aren't polar, there, there, there is a sort of, you know, something which happens between them. And I think also about what we actually do know, um, questioning that. Mm. I mean, I think fiction gives you a space to, because it's a, f a fictional space, it's not trying to be memoir, it's not trying to be autobiography, it's not mm. pretending to be the truth. It gives you the freedom, I don't know if you guys agree, to explore a whole or express a whole lot of other stuff that is actually personal, but mm -hmm. it's displaced. So you, you're able to kind of play around with it in a way that you wouldn't in a memoir or an autobiography. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in a very superficial way, that sort of, the idea of writing a musical about Basil de Sandwana, that that's in the book, but some other random tourist says it. I'm like, that must have happened. That sounds so random, it must have really happened. So it's great hearing that that actually is. But that, you know, it's a small superficial point, but on the deeper point we'll get to about fiction as being sort of lying your way to the truth um, and those, mm -hmm. those blurry lines. So the other blurry line um, with Craig's book, as well as with David's, who we'll get to soon, I'm not ignoring any of the panelists, we can talk to everybody, um, is about the blurring of the sort of historical and the contemporary storylines. So there's the historical 150 years ago, um, Isan Dwana and the sort of the soldier and what's happening there, but also then Sam's, Sam's mystery. And I'm wondering in terms of the writing. So when you read the book, there are these sort of fantastic, incredible... <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> I was going to say echoes and things that reverberate <laughs> through oh the text. Oh, my gosh. Um, and I was wondering if, those, if that was happening while you were writing it. Were you writing these things sort of um, at the same time or was something that you'd write the one narrative and then later go and write the third one and then sort of bulldoze in from the outside? I mean, they're, they're little intentional um, echoes between the different narratives. So something that is said to Daniel in the contemporary time, he then uses that little bit of dialogue in his historical novel. Um, and, and, and at the heart of the novel are these butterflies that sort of float between the different narratives. Um, I was reminded, um, I don't know if you know the artist Deborah Bell, but, but I, I sort of interviewed her a couple of times and actually wrote a, a, a sort of a book about her that hasn't actually been published yet, but it was sort of commissioned by the Ever Reed Gallery. And she has this wonderful story about how she was painting the snake um, and then she walked you know, through her courtyard at her, in her house and she saw this puff adder lying in the courtyard. Um, and she thought, oh gosh, I better get the snake collector to to get that snake. So she phoned the snake people and then described the snake she was painting <laughs> rather than the puff adder. She said, there's this yellow snake with red spots or whatever she said. And the snake guy was like, yellow snake with red spots, never heard of that. But the sort of thing of, 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 of your fictional world and your everyday world melding and, 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 and often as a writer, you, you're somewhere in between, because you, know, you, you have to carry a book around with you all the time. It has to be like a Christmas tree that's sort of lit up inside you. And if you leave it for a few days, lights start going out. And if you're sitting down and you, you're trying to remember what you've written, you, you're lost. That's a terrible... Mm. Because it's about a kind of interconnected constellation of words and images and ideas. And, you know, it has to have this interconnectedness to, to be fully alive. Um, so you have to sort of carry it. So, so you carry this, this book with you and... And, um, and I try to reflect a little bit of that in the, in the novel where, where it, you sort of, the division between your fictional world and your everyday life feed into each other. And that's why I'm not sure that Chat GPT is ever going to be able to write a good literary novel because it's, it just, it doesn't live embedded in the world as we do. I like that, the Christmas tree. Mm. 
I like that the analogy. interconnected constellations, because that was such a brilliant segue to David's book. Yes. yes. <laughs> Yay. Hi, David. Hi. I'm also here. <laughs> Hello. Sorry, we made you wait. No, I'm joking. It's just like <laughs> threw out that anxiety for as but long as But I like the constellations. Could. It's yes. perfect, yes. Yes. So talk a little bit about... about constellations. About your constellations, about your study of Einstein and astrophysics. Einstein. Yes. Um, well, <laughs> talking about like writing what you know, I think I wrote the kind of book that I wanted to read. And at the time, I think that it was a lot of different... I think books <laughs> ended up sort of being in one. So there's astronomy in there, there's botany, there's geology. Um, maybe there are too many elements. No. No, no. no. <laughs> but I think, you know, I think writing's a very personal thing and it's a sort of book I wanted to read at that time. Um, and I think, and I don't like when people talk about love letters to this or that, but I suppose it is in a way a love letter to the Karoo and the landscape. And I started off um, talking about uh, past and present, with this image of a Victorian woman walking up a kopi with a crinoline, um, and then coming down at the same time was a young boy in our present day. So the wine was happening in 1800, and the wine was happening now, and they sort of passed right alongside each other without seeing one another. And there was, so, I don't know why, I started off with that, um, and I, I wanted to create something where the past and future and present sort of collide, um, in terms of, yeah, I've always been interested in astronomy, in, in botany. Um, so in a way, like the research started since I was, I guess, 12, you know, all these things are topics I was interested in. Um, what was the question? I was going I've forgotten as well, but yeah. we'll ask another constellations, question. Constellations, constellations. Uh, yes. This has got nothing to do with constellations. <laughs> um, yes, no, I know how I can bring it in. So I think a central theme of the book is looking at how we use narrative within our own lives to to create meaning because without that you know there's the terror of chaos and everything's random like how do you make sense of loss which is a big theme of of the book if if there's no overarching structure and I you mean you can find that in religion in science but I feel like we all need some sort of we need to feel that life is going somewhere so like the constellations in the sky we create constellations within our <laughs> lives um, that makes sense, right? It's like the Christmas tree kind of thing. I can also use metaphors. Um, yo, what else can I say? Doing very well. Maybe tell us about who is Michael yes, and Michael. Erica and Elizabeth Tennant. Okay, and the constellation between them. And what Michael's doing in the crew. Okay, yeah. so Michael it is the protagonist, I guess. It opens up in the present day with Michael, who's living alone in Hatfield Street with his cat after a breakup. He's sad and lonely. Um, He's not like you. Not like me at all. <laughs> um, and he's doing his PhD on this uh, Victorian writer named Elizabeth Tennant, who I loosely based on Olive Schreiner's life. So, um, and her journal has just been discovered in the Karoo. Um, so while he's kind of re reading it and researching it, he comes across this sentence written 100 years ago that seems to be about him and his mother. So, you know, mystery, what's going on? He travels to the Karoo, where she lived and wrote her book, Mirage, also called Mirage, to try and make sense of, of this line and this journal and to see, is there some connection between, of two, the, between the two of them or is it something that he's just imagining? You know, was there sort of like a breach in time in 1800 and now where they're sort of talking to each other across the centuries or is it something that he's latching onto to make sense of loss because he needs some kind of connection. Um, yeah, so I think it's a book about loss. And what I must mention, Erica. Erica is his mother who passed away when he was 12. Um, and I think in many ways the book is a, it's sort of a pilgrimage in the crew where Michael's trying to make sense of that loss and to, you know, to ask what, what happens to the things we lose in this world? Do they really disappear forever? Do they slip through to another realm? Um, are they really gone? And what does that mean? So you mentioned there um, Elizabeth Tennant being based on Olive Schreiner. Yes. And when you read the book, or certainly when I read the book, um, Starfontaine, which is the sort of the Karoo town which most of the book plays out in, very much reminds me of Michael's Fontaine. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. So I just want to talk a little, I want you to talk a little bit about those uh, those inspirations and the research mm. you did into Schreiner and into Michael's Fontaine. Um, and in terms of then also the name changes, I mean, did not sort of, you know, 
And I don't know anything about writing a novel. I just sell books. I don't have to write them or know anything about how you publish them. But mm. the fact that you're not choosing to sort of dig into Olive Schreiner mm. as there's interest in her or dig into Mikey Spontane. Some people are like, oh, Mikey Spontane. There's a kind of mystery aura. There's that, you've spoken about the sense of, of desolation and, and, and loss and, in the Karoo that that mm. kind of taps into and a timelessness there. Um, so the choice not to kind of like keep those sort of realistic you know, all those um, sort of references to Olive Shrine and Michael Spontane, mm. but you sort of reimagine them as Louis Tennant and Sarah Fontaine, which is beautiful and beautifully done, but just curious. So you're asking why, why did I do that? Yes. Well, I think, um, you know, you don't want to be tied down by fact. Or sp I think what fiction does is it allows, you, it allows you to imagine things and to dream and to project into other possibilities. And I think... Um, you know, talking about research and stuff, I, I love to use it as a kind of springboard to explore other possibilities, but you don't ever want to feel like you're making a, a documentary, I guess. Um, you know, you want, you, want, you want to feel as the writer that anything can still happen. Um, but I think it was definitely based on Michael Spontane. I remember traveling through there with a friend a while back who's in the audience um, and just looking up at the stars and being amazed at the sort of layers of time, you know, you have this Victorian village that feels like nothing's changed in a hundred years and you, you almost don't know, like, is that a choice? Are they consciously curating it like that or has it really just not moved on for a hundred years? Um, you know, up above you, you have the stars, which are also, in a way, they're in the past because the light takes a certain amount of time to reach us and the speed is finite, not to get into science and stuff, but I mean, and then beneath you, you have the, the rocks and the geology, which also is millions of years, you know, the, the further down you go. So I think that's what really is something I wanted to capture in the book um, without tying it to something factual necessarily. Like, so it's based on Olive Schreiner's life, but I mean, obviously she never wrote about portals and dimensions and things. Um, so I, I used it until it became necessary to deviate and sort of create my own fantasy. Mm -hmm. of these things which I find fascinating. Yeah. Mm. And the landscape writing in this book is absolutely exquisite, and as is the, the landscape writing of Isel Dwana, we, I've never been to, but I feel like I have walked there, and I've done the walk um, with Daniel from there down to Fugitive Drift and Bork Drift, and like, these places really come alive through the writing. Um, a place which maybe doesn't seem to always come alive in writing, which comes out in David's book, is the archives and the library, and I love there are two scenes where where Michael's in the library in the archives. And it reminds me also, Wanjira, of, of your research, um, UCT, and writing. I just wonder, yeah, so writing your, your book and your use of archival materials, and then we can link from there into Bookbunk, which you knew I wanted to ask you about. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, the archive is everything. I, I have never appreciated the, the benefit of distance and time when I was writing as, as, as when I was writing this book because as I mentioned I had been in Kenya I watched this election and the violence on the news but there was something special about stepping back and and looking at somebody else's recollection of it and in this case somebody else was like the librarian at UCT sometimes it was YouTube sometimes it was just whatever the Google results would give me on that day um, so I spent, I mean, Havoc of Choice took eight years to write from, from the, the, the master's program to getting it out. And even when I was done with the master's program, I revised it every single year for those eight years. I had eight drafts over eight years. And every draft was a, a, a process of, of going back to the research and wondering why is there so much thinness. For instance, one thing that I, I was uh, completely upset about was how little documentation there was in the media. And in all of the reports and nonfiction I was reading about the violence, there was nothing about the number of women who were raped during the violence. 40,750 women, I know this number because I discovered it so late, were raped um, during this this period, and there was no coverage about it. I found it as a footnote on one report, and I'm like, hang on, what's, what's that about? And it made me rewrite a character to, so I could tell that story as well. Um, so because my training is in journalism, and, and when, when I'm curious about something, when I'm uncomfortable about something, when I'm telling a story that feels too big for me, I wrap myself in research, and for the Havoc of Choice, it was nine months, and then eight years after that, because every time I, I found something new, I had to come back and, and, and rewrite the story, which was, for the first six drafts, nonfiction. And then later, when I was 
close to publishing and I had had all of these editors from across the world reading it and telling me it's ready to go. I'm like, hey, but Kenyans haven't read this book and me, Kenyans on Twitter are the most vicious group of people you will ever meet. And I'm like, I'm not gonna get dragged so early in my career for getting things wrong because I was writing about a moment that meant something to Kenyans and I wasn't gonna get it wrong. Um, so I hired an editor, to, a Kenyan editor who was different as can be from, from me. He was a low man, older than me. He had barely spent any time growing up in Nairobi or, sm or in Nairobi, and I asked him to read the book and give me his criticism, and he did. And that was probably some of the, he tore it apart. He's like, you Kikuyu women, you can't just be saying these things and thinking nothing's gonna happen. So he really made me sit with the fact that I was making some very big statements and non-fiction statements, um, and they had repercussions. He's like, do you want to have a one book career? Then go ahead and publish it. Do you want to <laughs> have a longer career where you're able to do more um, and change more minds because you just have a large body of work? Then consider making these small changes and making this a fictional novel because it will travel further that way. I did, and I'm grateful for that. Um, and I don't know if I've answered your question about the archive. Yeah, but research and archives are my foundation. They're my bedrock, and they're the thing that, that keeps me warm when I'm in doubt about the things that I'm, the, the places that I'm delving into. And obviously the, the, the home for most or many archives are libraries and sort of place here for, you know, accurate and accessible and freely accessible information. Yeah. Enter Book Bank. <laughs> so when I finished um, my stint in Cape Town writing this book and I was ready to go back home because I couldn't get a special skills permit um, <laughs> and I was ready to go back home, um, I know that I did, I knew I didn't want to go back into the music industry because I had hit a ceiling there. I'm like, unless I can now begin singing myself, there's nothing I can do for this industry. And, um, and I was really considering like a career in writing and, and how I could make that work and also assessing the industry of, of writers in, in my country because there's been very beautiful moments for Kenyan writing, but also moments where there's nothing happening. And I think I was entering um, Kenya, coming back from Cape Town in a moment when nothing was happening, apparently. Um, and so I began to think about like the, the, the trajectory of my career and I realized because I couldn't see any libraries in Nairobi that were thriving and vibrant and the kind of libraries I'd experienced here in Cape Town, I'm like, I don't want to go back to Cape Town every time I want to write a book. I want to be able to write them in my city. I'm writing about Kenyans. I want to sit here and be inspired by watching Kenyans and write about them. And that was the biggest um, inspiration for Bookbank, which is an organization that's now seven years old. Oh my God, it's seven years old. Um, and we exist solely to adopt and restore public libraries. Um, we bully the government to give us spaces that they're not using, that are pieces, pieces they've built as libraries, but kind of neglected. And then we convert them into things we call palaces for the people. We have three, thank you. <laughs> um, we have three locations in Nairobi. One of them is the oldest library in Nairobi. It's called the Macmillan Memorial Library. It was built in 1931. And until 1962, black Kenyans were not allowed in there. So my grandmother never used it. My mom only used it recently because I told her, you can come in, it's now, it's now open to the public. And now two black women are, are, are shaping the future of this library, myself included. And we also have two other locations that are now fully renovated. They're much younger. They're in the eastern part of the city, which is very underserved. And those two spaces have about 700 kids coming in to do whatever the hell they want to. You wanna come and shout, come and shout. You wanna come and read? You want to come and play the flute or come and learn how to write? You, you find it at one of our libraries, and it's honestly, for me, the best intersection of my writing and my activism. Thank you. I want to link back to the intersection here between research and writing fiction and the idea of lying to tell the truth um, and how we use sort of truth and research as a way to serve the story that tells the truth. It might not necessarily be a sort of, you know, a, a biographical historical truth, but some sort of emotional, psychological, philosophical truth. And I'm not directing this to anyone because I'm just now opening it up and looking desperate and wanting people to talk back to me um, <laughs> about how you do that and what your focus is when you're doing it, what you choose, what you're keeping in, what you're putting out, how you're serving your story through the research and the writing. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I made a noise, I'll have to talk. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I mean, I think the danger with research is that you don't want to just produce a praise if they're already written. So if you read a whole lot of books and then write a book, you know, what are you really doing? So, um, I, you know, I, I think that research is there to, 
to serve the story that you're trying to tell. Um, obviously, I think history is a, it's a bit like memory. We reinvent it according to our needs in the present. Do you know what I mean? Um, so how, whatever meaning we need it to have for us now, we, we slightly retell it in a slightly different way. I mean, it is a research. We're searching again and probably not finding necessarily the thing we're looking for, but maybe we find some other thing. It's like remember, you know, we, we remembering something, putting it back together, having it, because it, it's been dismembered. Because, I mean, obviously we can't access the past. We can barely access the, pre well, we can't ac really fully access the present. Um, and certainly not through language. You know, just to represent this moment now is completely impossible. They, I look out and all these faces are looking at me with slightly different intentions, and thankfully I don't know what's going on in their heads. But, I mean, I you know, we couldn't represent, especially through language, what is happening right now in this moment, you know. So, um, and, and language is, is, a, is, is, a, is a metaphorical, you know, it's, it, it, fictions are metaphorical spaces, you know, that's not the real. So we create the illusion of the real. We, we, um, and that's sort of the joy of it as well, because it's an escape from the sort of tyranny of the present and the sort of anxiety, the, dis the chaos of the, of, of, of the present. And, we, we can, and, and so we, we use other texts, we use all sorts of things to, to create these fictions, these stories. Um, and yeah, so... I, th I think that often one has to, you have to do a bit of re research, at, but give yourself the space to tell the story you want to tell, and then, like you did, really check, check your facts. I mean, I was very fortunate with my, with my novel to have um, Ian Knight, who's the sort of world expert in the Battle of the Sinai, he lives, he lives in Britain, who I, I sort of ran my plot by him, and he responded about, you know, w what was credible and how it would work, and, and sent me a whole lot of articles and historical precedents so that you know, I can write that story. And then, and then I had this wonderful chap called Steve Woodhall, who Paul in the audience actually thankfully introduced me to, who's, this, who's the um, S Southern African butterfly expert and a lovely, generous man. And um, he just told, you know, my, my, my historical figure is a lepidopterist. And I had to know all about butterflies and, you know, the late 1800s and what had been named and what hadn't been named and what the techniques for catching them were and all that stuff. And he helped me. And, you know, so all of that sort of authentic detail, because it's, you've got to suspend your disbelief. You've got to, it's, it's got to be credible. You've got to take an, the audience on that journey. So it's very important to me to, to do that as thoroughly as I can. But we're telling a story now. I mean, I wrote this novel out of Corona, really. It's actually... It was so. It was really absorbing the uncertainty, the endangered darkness. Sort of, we we were all experiencing at that time. I think we 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 sort of trying to forget in a way how scary it was. And so I, you know, I wrote about war and I wrote about this loss of this child. You know, this atmosphere of death, and and really wrote a novel that was trying to kind of find light, life, connection, miracle, God, if you like. You know, just just. Um, the mystery under all things and trying to really find through a genuine process meaning you know and and so it's about meaning making now for me and hopefully others can kind of gain something from that as well but you know those books are, and those stories are only there to serve the needs of the present and, and hopefully our readers in the present and the and yes, I mean, it's, I think it's lovely to learn something. I mean, I think you learn about butterflies when you read my novel. You learn about history. You learn all sorts of things. But, but hopefully it's food for living. For me, literature should be like nutrients. And when you read a book, you should be able to go back out into the world with something restored or something resolved or something to work with or a picture to move towards, you know. David, the, the meaning or the, the mystery under all things and how to make meaning out of the chaos using different systems. Your book has got, <coughs> yeah, sort of the astrophysics, astronomy, it's got mythology, it's got religion, literature, all these different geology, different mm. sort of systems in which we can try and sort of, or especially David or uh, Michael sort of tries to not control the chaos, David. but tries to. <laughs> hmm? No, no, no. Da Did you say David? David as yeah. well. Well, yes. yeah, Michael, David. Michael. Um, well, I think. So are you talking about like how, to, how we use systems to create meaning from chaos? Yes, and how Michael yeah. does that in the yeah. book. Yeah, yeah. trying well, to find answers. Mm. 
I think, well, for me, okay, the writing process, I don't know if you guys agree with this, but a lot of it is subconscious. You know, you don't quite, while you're writing, you don't quite know where the book is going, but in a good way, because you want to be pulled along by a current while you're writing it. And I think that's where, where, you, where you do research into all these things, the stars and the rocks and all that, and the botany. You don't want to feel that you have to be, like your writing's determined by that. So I what was a joyful process for me was letting myself be surprised with where it's going. And when I don't understand something, then I turn to the research as opposed to vice versa. Um, but I think hmm, all these different systems of meaning, um, I think one of the things that I found most interesting, interesting when writing the book was that, and I spoke about this earlier, but time doesn't really exist. On, at, at the level of particles and, and you know, if you, those equations that physicists use to describe our world, there's no variable of time, actually. It's something that we impose um, at our macro level, if that makes sense, um, to make sense of the world. Um, and that the, the thing that how we measure time is change. If nothing changed, we wouldn't be able to perceive time. Um, if everything stayed exactly the same and the sun didn't, well, the earth didn't turn and the sun didn't move, we would have no way of knowing that time was moving on. So time implies loss and nostalgia and, and memory. Um, and I think for me, using all these astrophysics and all that, it was, it was a way of making sense of the world and, and a search for something greater that you can place these losses within so that it makes sense to you. You know, for, for me, like science and religion, they all kind of do the same thing in that they allow us to, want, to wonder at the world and to make sense of it and to contain it, almost. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Okay. It makes sense. Okay. We're going to open up to questions from the floor in two minutes. So if you've got a question, just stick your hand up and the mic will come to you. Um, but while we wait for that, um, so two of you are debut novelists, and I think there's often, or maybe... Sometimes there's advice given of if you're starting out and you're not sure, write historical fiction because then you can always fall back on the research. Not sure what's happening in the story, okay, go and read a few books and then that'll kind of be advice. Has anyone given you that advice? Was that helpful advice in terms of if you had to, having now written your debut novel or Craig having written eight novels and eight plays, what advice would you give to writers who want to know about this relationship between research and writing fiction? Um, so with the writing of the Havoc of Choice, I, there was no question about what, what the plot was because we all knew what happened. I think where the magic for me was was putting characters in the space and then watching them navigate the violence. And, and that, I think, is, is the, the, the juice of, I think, writing for me that you, 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 you should know some things but you, you should know everything. Some things should just happen on the page. And, it, and I used to really roll my eyes at writers who say, you know, sometimes you're just sitting there and then like, things happen and you just kind of go. And I'd be like, ugh, no, I'm a spreadsheet kind of writer. I want to map everything out and I have walls where I put all of my plot points there. But in this case, I would ha because I knew the plot, I would then introduce characters who take my plot elsewhere. And I'm like, what are you doing? What, what's happening here? Um, but that's, that's the, I guess, the dance that we do. Um, and I doubt that I'm answering your question now because I forgot what it was. <laughs> Me too. Oh, gosh. <laughs> it was yeah, advice. Uh, advice. <sighs> Man, I don't even take writing advice. I don't take writing advice myself. So if I find it really hard to do it. But if I had to do one thing, I had to say one thing. Um, the most valuable thing for me when it came to writing was going to school. Not because it made me a better writer. I don't think I became a better writer by going to UCC, but it forced me to finish a book. Um, and that, that is the most valuable. It, it, it forced me to finish a book because if you, you could do a master's program for years and years and years, as I was saying earlier, but you're going to have to pay for years and years and years of school fees. And that was a wonderful motivator for me. Um, it gave me the community to, 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 to commune with people, to be with people who are writing and struggling with things that I was doing. And I'm not saying everybody has to, but you can find community everywhere. Um, and, and that for me has been, has been my rock, but also to, to ch choose topics that you know li little enough about to be curious. I, if I wasn't curious about the violence and the election, I would have dropped this book in draft four. But I kept uh, um, finding questions and kept discovering things and my curiosity is still today very piqued about what, what could happen for Kenya in the future when it comes to our democracy and our voting. Um, so you have to pick something that you know you, you can form an obsession with because if you are bored with your topic, so will your readers. 
Um, and that has proven true because um, I now have a three-year bestseller. So something's <laughs> going right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it's not going to matter to you, it's not going to matter to the reader. Yeah. Um, and I mean, advice to writers is, is useless because everyone has to find their own way. Yeah. And, and actually, each time you write a new novel, you have to relearn how to write a novel because each story requires its own form to best express it. And, you know, just each story for me has a kind of a wood grain that's specific to it. And wow. it takes a while to kind of find that. And that's why for me starting is the hardest because you're establishing so many things. Once it's up and running, that kind of internal wood grain has its own internal laws that takes it in a particular mm -hmm. place. So establishing it is hard. It's like a th thumbprint for each book. You know, each one is different. If you have a writer's voice, I think that emerges kind of in spite of yourself. But I think often people have a little desire. That I'm sure a lot of people in this room have started a novel because there's a little nugget, a little seed, a little thing that, that ignites them, it excites them, they start writing. And then they get a couple of pages or a couple of chapters in and they kind of get lost. Mm. Um, and, and I think that's because you're not making clear decisions about what story you really want to tell. You know, writer's block happens when you don't know what story you're telling. When you know what story you're telling, you, you develop a kind of momentum. You don't get in your car and just start driving unless you're just trying to get away from your partner or something. But do you know what I mean? You, you get in your car because you're driving to Woolworths or you're driving to Durban. Do you know what I mean? And you might change your mind while driving to Woolworths and say, actually, I want to buy the fillet state from wherever and go there instead. But, but you have to have a directedness. And I think we often don't think about our audience enough as well. Like, mm -hmm. wh what provocation do I want to send out into the world? Uh, you know, we need to be political. We need to want to provoke change. We want to disrupt. We want to engage. We want to excite people about something. We, you, know, um, you know, that also helps with the kind of directedness. But I'd, um, I certainly can't sit down and start writing. You know, you, I, I have to have a reason to write, and, and, and you must be clear about that reason. It's often in that little gold nugget that starts the whole thing, and you've got to be true to it. And what often happens with these creative writing courses mm -hmm. is you do draft after draft, and you get all these experts and all these people telling you stuff, and you lose it, and then it dies in you. And then it could just be anyone's book. It has to be your book. It has to have your fingerprints on it. Can I just ask a follow-up? I, I must ask you about the second book, your second, um, just number two in general, because I am struggling, I was talking to Jennifer about the struggle of number two, um, and just how did you get your second book out? And like, I know I said I don't take advice, but now I'm asking for some. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I'm sure it's different for, for different people. I, I, I think it will announce itself. You know, I, I, I don't think, you know, for me, the ideas that are worth writing the ones, are the ones that keep coming back. You know, I think as a writer, you get lots of ideas and, and you forget about them. I don't keep journals or anything like that anymore. And so the ones that I end up writing are the ones that keep coming back, often for years. Mm. And they develop a kind of organically an underground life. And um, so it might be a book that you've already started that you're too scared to write mm. or that you don't know how to write or that frightens you or I don't know. Do you know what I mean? It, it's, it's probably you already, re, already actually know there. what that book is. It's a question. I don't know. Are there questions from the floor? Right all the way at the back, straight for the mic. We are recording. It is on its way. There we go. Uh, afternoon, guys. Thanks so much for um, this conversation. Um, before I even start my question, I, I don't want to mispronounce your name, um, Wan Jiru. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, I mean, for, for all the panelists, but specifically for you, because you spoke about um, how ruthless Kenyans can be on social media and kind of the, the, this idea that um, this part of the history was swept under the rug and there was a, a sort of national silent agreement, if you will, that like we're not going to talk about this. So I wonder if you got any like <coughs> backlash for dredging up in, in, in inverted commas, you know, this, the, um, this tumultuous, you know, part of, of your lives that you wanted to forget and how you engaged with it or dealt with it, if at all. Um, yeah, like what were the consequences of, of that? Thank you. Um, I see this and I'm knocking on all the wood, but so far nothing, no backlash has happened. And I think that's because that book is, is, is burdened by truth. I haven't told a single lie. Um, in fact, what I get is people, I have a, a bunch of DMs in my Instagram with people crying. 
and and because I've I've, I've just woken up, I've I've, sc- I've picked up a scab and left it open, and that's the one thing I wish I wish I put a trigger warning at the at the cover of my book for like if you lost someone in 07, then perhaps read this with a warm community of people hugging you because it's a difficult read so I don't have people um have had no backlash yet I also don't think I read as many reviews as I should but but I do have someone who does and, and if there was backlash I think it would have gotten to me by now but I think it's because I was very intentional about rooting this thing in truth I haven't told a lie people know what it felt like it's very emotionally true uh, in addition to being fact- factually correct but after the book came out in 2020 and it came out in the pandemic, so I didn't really do a lot of these forums. It was all on Zoom and I could be very selective about it. But a year out, I had, we had done like three or four reprints at this stage and I'm just like, this book is doing a thing. It's really resonating with people. Um, and I began to feel a huge sense of responsibility for picking at this scab and leaving it open because people have real trauma. And now I've written this book and then I haven't given them solutions because my book has no has no neat ending. It's still very, uh, there's no resolution in Kenya about the violence. So there's not going to be no resolution in my book about the violence. But what I did is that I then did a, a whole bunch of other research and found all of the free counselors and therapists I could find in Kenya who are working with people who have PTSD. And I published that list on my website, anywhere where people would come to me and be like, where do I take all of this grief I'm feeling? Because you can't bring it to me because I, I think the writing of the book was my catharsis. It was my process of dealing with the violence. But for other people, I can't be that. That's not my responsibility, unfortunately. But there are people who are trained and who give this help to people. So I've, I've done a lot of work of directing Kenyans who have nowhere to take their grief to and t- telling them to people who can help them heal. Um, and if my book just does just that, then I'm happy. Um, but it's doing a lot more. And I think because it's emotionally true, no one has come for me yet. And if they do, I will move back to Cape Town. <laughs> <laughs> we'll welcome you back with open arms. Thank you. Right. More questions? While well, people are thinking, maybe your second book is the book you came to Cape Town to write. About my dad, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I have to learn how to speak my mother tongue. Because I also la- figured that um, I, when, I, when I started writing the book, I discovered how little I knew about my father. Even if I loved him, but I didn't know about his life before he was my father. And the only people I could ask, ask these questions don't speak English. And it's a tragedy of, of growing up in Nairobi. But I have to learn Kikuyu before I can write that book. And I'm on it. I'm working on it. I'm, I'm signed up for mm-hmm. classes as we speak. The microphone is coming to the front. (coughs) Hey, guys. Um, So two, I mean, eight years, eight drafts, that's crazy. Um, And it was also part of a master's project. I'm just curious now that, I'm crazy, I don't know how difficult it was for you to write this book, but how do you feel about it now that it's in the world? When you see your book on a shelf, are you sort of glad that it's out of you and done? Or, you know... Do you cringe a little bit? Do you want to, or do you like look at it and think, "Oh, I want to page through it and read it more"? You know, I can. I mean, for me, this has been the most anxious part is when it's finally out in the world, which is weird because I thought it would be the writing and the sitting down. I mean, you probably know this. You've written it. Oh, that's what I'm. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I think it's like when you see it as something that's outside of you and you realize, "Oh, this I can't change anything any longer." Like this is what it is. And I remember the day it was published, all the things that I feel like I should have done clicked in my head I'm like oh my word and I was like if I just changed that sentence the book would be so much better which is probably not even true but um no I mean I think it was that was the hardest part for me was when it actually was in the world and sometimes I'd walk past a bookshop and see it and just be like no I don't want to see um I don't know if you guys feel that way it's I agree. scary yeah it's, it's the the hardest part has been it coming out into the world in fact I was talking um earlier and I was saying I wish I changed my name I wish I published under someone else's name because <laughs> I am a big introvert. I love, I'm a production person. I like to be in the background making things happen. I don't want to be in the forefront. So I, and I had like, my instincts kicked in like at the last minute, I'm like change your name or just do like W <laughs> Koinange or, or something. I didn't and I regret it. Um, yeah, and it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, W.H. Auden quoting a French poet said, a, a poem is never finished. It's only ever abandoned. Ah. You know, now you can count working on a, on a thing forever. But there comes a point where you draw a line and you put it out into the world. And, I mean, I've, I've since had all sorts of brilliant ideas as to how to improve my novel. Mm. But it's out in the world. Um, and I've never been able to reread anything I've, I've written. I mean, obviously, when you write a play, you have to then watch it. And it's so awful because the audience are in 
front of you, you know, <laughs> laughing or yawning or, you know. On their phones. On their, yeah, on their phones. I mean, I mean, I remember, <laughs> and audiences are weird. I mean, I remember one night when I worked at the market theatre, I had a play called The Dream of the Dog, and someone vomited into their <laughs> handbag. <laughs> and downstairs we had a production of a play called Blackbird, which is all about, you know, child abuse. <laughs> And there was a man in the audience trying to look under the dress of the actress who was busy talking about child abuse. And you just like think, who are these people? But <laughs> so you don't know who's going to be reading your book and what they're going to think or say or do. Um, and I mean, you know, when the Dream House was a set work, I had completely forgotten really what ended up. Well, I hadn't completely forgotten, but I'd, it was published in 2015. And I think it was a set work in something like 2019. So I hadn't thought about it for some years. And I'd written lots of drafts, and it had been a play, and I'd written many, many drafts of that play, and there'd been di different versions of the play. It had been a radio play in 2006, play at the Market Theatre 2007, play in the UK in 2008, I mean, 20, uh, Hilton Festival 28, 2010, a, a new version in England, and then drafts of novels. So I couldn't always remember what was in the final draft, and I was going to schools and s talking about the novel, and I suddenly realized I was actually talking about things that happened in other drafts. <laughs> And I had to listen to the, the audible version <laughs> to remind myself of what I'd written. Um, and actually, I, quite, I, thought it was, I thought it was quite good. <laughs> <laughs> I was pre pleasantly surprised, because I was, I, was, I was waiting to hate it. But um, yeah, I mean, I think the meaning of things changes as well in terms of context. Mm. I mean, the player at Paul Slabbers, he's just done Saturday Night at the Palace again. And I was talking to him about it recently and how what's not even a, th a thing in the play when it comes out, how in our context is another whole thing. Um, I mean, my novel, The Dream House, I think has became more contemporary as we started reflecting more honestly on privilege and complacency of those who have privilege. And you know, that conversation wasn't really happening when the novel came out, but it, it, it sort of, yeah. So it's funny how the, their meaning changes through time as well. There's a question in the front. Question in front. I'll I'll give it up to the mic so I can do a quick question and then pass it on. Um, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Good, thanks. Thanks for bringing the books alive today. Uh, it's been beautiful to hear. Um, I'm curious about the choice not to use a historical figure in the books. Um, I'm hearing a lot about the historical context, and I know David mentioned that. There's a lot about Oliver Schreiner, but chose not to use her directly. Um, and also, I mean, the, the, the option, say, of using one of the political figures in Kenya. I'm just wondering, uh, Craig, I'm sure you don't remember what your draft was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering if that was a deliberate choice and how that, sh that shaped the narrative. Um, well, I mean, yeah, because I... For another, another figure that was a real figure, um, my uh, grandmother's name is Elizabeth Tennant, and I wanted to use her as a, as a, like a homage to her. Um, so I called my main character Elizabeth Tennant, but I spelt it with, two, with one N, because I thought, you know, let me change it up a little bit. And when my grandmother read it, the first thing she said was, oh, David spelled my name wrong. <laughs> um, but I mean, that was intentional, and it's the same with Olive Schreiner, like I, the aspects of her life that inspired me, but the character in the book is definitely not Olive Schreiner. You know, it's, it's her ideas, um, and it's, you know, aspects of her life filtered through myself. You know, Elizabeth Tennant is as much a version of myself as I think Craig said, like, we, you can't help but write about yourself. Um, and it's, so it would, it would be wrong to call her Olive Schreiner because she, she isn't, because it's fiction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the people I wrote about um, at the point of releasing the book were still alive um, and still are today. Um, and that's also one of the cases that the editor who made me turn it to fiction made. He's like, it's fine to, to kind of say, for instance, one of the critiques he gave me was that you don't really blame anyone for the violence, but when you, when you point a finger, you're pointing at the person, the opposition leader, basically, who's a separate tribe from you, opposition, oppos opposite tribe from I am. And we're very political, in, I mean, we're very tribal in Kenya. So it was one of those things for, you need to say, if you're gonna mention their names, remember that just like your grandfather, these are human beings with families, and you can mention their names if it's absolutely necessary, but can you pass the message across without doing so? Because the one thing we all know is that, um, well, I know that, 
a lot of the time people don't change systems, systems change systems. So to, to, to kind of pin the, or blame one person is, is really putting a system's fault on one person and it, it just didn't do the, it wasn't necessary. If those people read the book, they know I'm talking about them, but I'm not naming them. I'm, I'm, I'm letting their name, I'm giving them the benefit of, of one little sliver of anonymity, even if the entire country knows who exactly I'm talking about, but I just didn't feel necessary to go there. Um, yeah. I, mean, um, I think fiction is often concerned with people who, you know, if you want to read a history book, you know, sort of read a history book, but fiction's trying to kind of talk about the lives of the people who aren't necessarily in the history books. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It serves, I think, a slightly different function. I mean, I wrote a novel called The Landscape Painter. It had the Anglo-Boer War. And in that war, there was, Mahatma Gandhi was a stretcher bearer. And, you know, there were people like Churchill. And Churchill sort of appears pointing importantly to the horizons on, on the edge of a hill at one point, and then he disappears again. And there's the stretcher bearer who's a sort of Indian guy. You don't know if it could be Gandhi or not because he's not Gandhi yet. So I sort of put, put people in, but, but in a fleeting sort of way. Um, and I'm much more interested in, in the person who's sort of passing through the battle and doesn't know what the hell's going on. And do you know what I mean? Um, it's, it's the, I, think, I think fiction does that so beautifully. It unearths these untold stories about, about, about the faceless or the nameless. I mean, I think mm. part of your your book very much is about yeah. trying to speak for people who ha whose story hadn't been heard, and um, and that's part of the power, I think, often of, of fiction. Yeah, which you will discover afterwards when you buy all of these books and read them and have personal conversations with the authors who will be at the signing table oh. after time the session. Yeah. So unfortunately, our time is now up for this conversation, but you will be able to continue the conversation when you sit at home with your copy of the book and you read them. The authors will be there at the signing table for you to sign afterwards. Please do buy the books. It's very important that these continue, conversations continue. Thank you so much to all of you for being, for being here and for listening to us. And we will see you downstairs. And thank you.